I just thought it was worth framing this in terms of the wider picture that we're now seeing. So for AMR control, both WHO and CDC are talking about the four pillars of AMR control, with number one being improving infection control, two, practical stewardship, three, surveillance, and four, research, which includes rapid diagnostics, new antimicrobial development, and innovations in infec infection control, the sort of things that could be done in low and middle income countries. So when you hear people talk about the four pillars, this is what they're about. And I think it's really important, and, and it's maybe a little disappointing, you know, that recently, they, this week, they released the MRFF research priorities, and infection control wasn't in the One Health AMR uh, research agenda, which I think is a bit of a shame because there's plenty of multi-resistant organisms out there and it's about cross-transmission more than the emergence of new strains. But nevertheless, um, there are other initiatives, I guess, um, that will help with that. So uh, some of you will have met Benedetta Alagranzi last year. She spoke at this conference. She's a real star. She's the head of this section at WHO. And just for those of you who didn't get a copy last year, this is available off the web now, the uh, WHO core components of infection control. And, um, and it, it has a very clear map, mapped out strategy for this, and you should, probably should look at that and see whether your hospital, you know, how it fits into this strategy. So this is the first time we've got a very, you know, some of the things are a bit basic, but some of the other things like, do you have a standardised cleaning process for your hospital? Pretty basic, but many of us would kind of look, you know, I'm not sure, um, so it's good. And uh, here are the two superstars uh, photographed um, because they're colonised with CRE, not true. Um, but the WHO just this year has released these global guidelines for prevention and control of CRE uh, as well as Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. So the emerging issues I was going to cover, and some of these we've talked about enough and I'm wary of time, so we'll, I'll skip over a few of these. But the first of these is the Hawthorne effect, and we have talked about this. But um, this paper by Mary Lou McClaws, which was uh, alluded to before, you know, I think it's just the important issues about how these things can be misreported. And you know, it's ended up as a beat up the doctors or beat up the healthcare workers thing when it really wasn't um, like that at all. And in fact, this reporter, the first thing she called about was, can you tell us the hand hygiene rates for the worst hospitals in New South Wales? That was her starting question. Well, of course, we don't release that data, but in the end she got it uh, from somewhere. But, um, you know, so the, the bigger issue with this, we, we've estimated that it's about 7%. Why do we think it's 7%? Because when we switched to using iPhones and iPads, everyone's rates went down 7% because people thought they were just texting their boyfriends or girlfriends. Um, and so that, you know, they knew they were there, but they didn't realise they were auditing. Um, I don't think that's really the issue. The issue is what we were discussing earlier in that question session. That is, we're moving to, you know, not just constantly auditing bad behaviour, but saying stop, improve. Well, of course, the whole point is that you're then artificially, well, not artificially, you're doing what you're meant to do, and that is improving something, so your rates will look better, OK? And um, so it's not really a Hawthorne effect. It's what you're meant to be there for, and that is to improve things and educate. Um, I do think that, you know, as an organisation, you know, the National Hand Hygiene Initiative, we really should be looking at a better way of putting it is how representative are these rates to the whole of, you know, we were talking earlier about Westmead and saying, well, all your wards audit, but do you, are you confident that that's the same at night shift or during the weekends? And having sat, my son was sick some years ago, and sat, having sat next to him all weekend, for two weeks in a row, and I know that in the middle of the night the hand hygiene rates aren't like that. And so we're actually pushing back. Different states contact us and hospitals saying, oh, we, we've now been told our benchmark's 90 per cent. And I said, this is ridiculous. It would be better, more impressive to me to say that your benchmark was 80 per cent or even 75 per cent, but it was every shift of the day, every day of the week. And, that, and every one of your healthcare workers was at that percentage, because statistically you'd be at 90 per cent if you did that, but that would be a more productive way of discussing it, I think. So increasingly, you know, we've had a lot of approaches that we're, how, you know, even in Victoria, should it go to 85 per cent? I said, no, it would be better to say that 10 per cent of all audit moments have to come from weekend shifts, and that we know that those weekend shifts are at 80 per cent, uh, and that, that will change the figures. Um, so, and I think the other things we've talked about, um, about auditing. 
Uh, what about burnout? I think we've already talked about this and there's been a lot of pre uh, stress on this, so I'll skip over this section. Um, needless just to say, you know, as we're discussing, the, the, the moments actually, five New South Wales hospitals currently contribute 10 per cent of the national data. In fact, it spooked us that maybe we should take their 10 per cent out to make sure the other 90 per cent were represented. And the figures, it, it didn't distort things because those five sites are doing very well. But um, it is about you know, how you want to embed this, and we discussed that earlier, and there are different ways of doing it for different hospitals. Um, and you can see here, this is just the uptake of the um, app, and, you know, the star performance, where's the mouse here? The mouse is not working, but the, um, you can see that here the star performer actually is, um, uh, is uh, Northern Territory, although they've only got five hospitals. Um, but even in Victoria, where there was a whole lot of funding for this, and uh, South Australia, where they've really, it's only a third. A third of institutions use hand hygiene uh, iPads. And so I guess, you know, uh, Jen Bradford, who led the Victorian um, uh, initiative on this, might want to comment later. But, you know, what is it? I think it's some of it's just technophobia, actually, particularly for country sites. So, but as everyone's looking at, the newspapers on their iPhone, iPads, I guess maybe that will change. But um, nevertheless, those sites that use the app, uh, it's far more efficient if you can uh, teach people to do it. And then finally, and most importantly, this some of you might have seen there's a big um, fuss about this, and this is really important that you understand it. So recently there was a paper, which I'll show you, about for the first time ever in the world, the reporting of alcohol tolerance in VRE. And what does this mean for the hand hygiene program? So, of course, the starting point is to say, well, does alcohol work, rub work as well against all bugs? And it doesn't. We know that. So, you know, norovirus, influenza, soap and water is actually better. Does it mean that alcohol rub, you should abandon it? No, it works OK, but it's not as good as soap and water. So there's often a tension, oh, we should, you shouldn't use alcohol rub if you've got a norovirus outbreak. That's not true. You should reinforce your alcohol rub usage, but say that if you've had contact with a patient, you're better to use soap and water if you can, um, not abandon alcohol rub. But also we know that certain bugs like uh, spore-forming pathogens like Clostridium difficile, some gram negatives, um, there's less data. Even the WHO database is largely based on skin organisms, not bowel organisms. Uh, and, and VRE, well, you know, this is a graph from my own institution, the Austin, where you can, um, and I don't have a mouse, but I'll, so I'll just walk over here. But, you know, you can see our staff rates have come down, but our VRE rates have gone up. And this is a time of very good hand, you know, improving hand hygiene. And so, and in fact, if you look at, this is a heat map of Europe where red and dark, um, you know, even maroon, is very high densities of VRE. Well, the eastern coast of Australia is the same as the worst countries in Europe in terms of VRE rates now. So VRE rates, are, excuse me, the new black. So does hand hygiene um, work as well for VRE? Well, we did a study some years ago using our alcohol-based product, which is alcohol chlorhexidine, isopropyl alcohol. And, um, and it does work very well. In fact, the overall about you know, 3.8 log kill. Um, this is using two different isolates. But what's really interesting was even in this, so, and it's on the basis of this for, the, for Van B VRE, we don't use gloves anymore unless we're hand, you know, fecally contaminated. We just rely on alcohol hand rub and a plastic apron. Van A is a different matter. Van A we treat like a CRE, full gowns, gloves and everything because it's uh, very problematic. But these were the 20, so the, in this study, what we did was we took 20 volunteers, volunteers, um, and we put uh, 12 logs of VRE on their hands, artificially contaminated, then got them to alcohol, rub their hands, and very carefully monitored the kill by our product. And overall, as I say, it was very good. However, at the time, we did notice some folks, so look, you can see patient or staff member H and J actually only had 1.6 logs and 1.58 log kill. And what was interesting is those staff members repeatedly, or whether it didn't matter what species uh, you were using, often had a lower count. And in fact, we ended up, spe and they were being observed, they were doing it properly. We actually wondered whether the oils on their hands, I mean, it was sort of a bit of a joke because 
they were both doctors, you know, whether, <laughs> what they were doing that made them so filthy. But um, it, it, the, the point was that there was some variability between staff members about the efficacy of alcohol rub against VRE. Okay? So with that, we um, uh, collaborated with Tim Stinier um, at the Doherty Institute. Paul Johnson was heavily involved in this, the last two authors. Um, and we actually started to look at um, the impact of alcohol rub on VRE. And um, you'll see in the top, top panel there, hey, this is from this paper that was in uh, Science Translational Medicine. So this is an American Journal of Science. It's like Science and Nature are the two um, really big pathogenesis journals. And you can see in that top frame there, the spread of log CFU reduction using alcohol rub um, in, for VRE isolates between 97 and 2003, then 2004 to 9, and then in the last five years or so. And it just seemed that pictorially that there was less kill in, with the more recent isolates. And then if you broke it down into what those strains were, this ST type, that it seemed like ST uh, 796 was more alcohol tolerant, and that's the new strain that has become dominant in our in East Coast hospitals. And so um, there was a concern that ST 796 is sort of a hospital adapted strain that has become alcohol tolerant. So this is a first in the world observation, okay, and the first time alcohol um, tolerance has been seen to emerge like this. Now where those two black arrows are. They're the two isolates that we saw that variability in our study with a couple of the patients. So they're not, it, it, the explanation is not that they were 796 and that we just uncovered it. It's just that there is some variability within the individual and that might be important if that person's a venipuncture nurse, for instance, right? And going from patient to patient like a bee between flowers. Um, but the main thing seemed to be 796. And what was really notable in this group, and this is obviously too much, but they've actually isolated the genetic element that seems to code for alcohol tolerance, and it can be switched on, or it's there in most VRE, most enterococci, and it's a matter of whether it's switched on or not, and we can't, haven't worked out yet what switches it on to um, produce resistance. Now, what was really interesting with this was actually the, and what finally got it published, and it hasn't displayed very well here, but there was, at the Doherty they had this thing called a mouse hospital, which is a floor set up like a little hospital with mice. And so the mice were given oral vancomycin and then fed VRE. So their guts were colonised. And then the floor of their cage where their faeces was, which clearly had that strain of VRE in it, was wiped with alcohol wipes, isopropanol wipes, isopropanol only, not with chlorhexidine, so not like our hand hygiene product. And what are, then they put clean mice in there that hadn't been given VRE, and the reality was that the pickup rate by those mice who were licking the floor, that the alcohol wasn't cleaning the floor adequately, and it showed cross transmission, much like in a human case. So there was a couple, of, and um, so this is what got it published. Now, Paul Johnson on the right, they, much to their irritation, they both got labelled incorrectly in the age, um, but Tim Stinney, who's on the left, you know, I. The, the report, I think even both, both of them would say, was slightly oversexed in the way it reported it, and it was even worse with the release in, from science. They said, you know, alcohol rub losing its efficacy because the only way the tolerance was detected was at 23% alcohol. Even if you used 35% alcohol, it just killed the VRE stone dead. So at the 70 to 75% concentrations we're using on hand rub, it has no clinical relevance, but it's a bit like, um, you know, pneumococcus, which is developing penicillin resistance that starts gradually. And the, the question was whether this paper identified an early signal of alcohol tolerance. Now, because of this, and, and somewhat disappointingly, um, great friend Didier Pitte, but a number of others, he went on Twitter, and some of you might have seen this, where there was this whole lot of stuff about fake news. Well, it wasn't fake news. The science is really, really strong. What he was trying to say was that if you use alcohol rub properly, it still kills VRE very well, um, aside from those couple of you know, patient-related issues that I just pointed out to you.
So there was a whole storm. And now what's really interesting, this is a map of Switzerland, but exactly at this same time, there was an outbreak of ST796, the very same strain in Bern, uh, the capital of Switzerland in the hospital there. And it's identical to the Australian strain and seems to, um, they haven't, we haven't looked at this in terms of alcohol tolerance, but it seems to be a hospital adapted strain. So, you know, evolution, the bugs are smart. And um, uh, again, they, you know, the Swiss are pretty obsessive with their hand hygiene and it doesn't seem to have made a material difference, but it's a hospital adapted strain that we don't totally understand. So what are the possible causes just in the last couple of minutes, because we are almost on time, but is hand hygiene products, I'm just presenting this to you because some of your um, uh, researchers will say, oh, I've read that alcohol hand rubs no use. Well, that's not true. What is true is that for the first time we've actually seen VRE with some alcohol tolerance. Now actually Acinetobacter, for instance, has been known to be alcohol tolerant for a long time. That's why Acinetobacter belmani is such a difficult organism to get rid of out of hospitals. So it's not, it's not like it's never been described before, but is it the first time that we've actually seen pr certain strains which are really can be killed very easily and now new strains of the same organism sort of evolving. So the message is not that, and certainly not this cartoon that was in one of the papers. But you could imagine if you're using a low quality product, a foam, where you don't really know the concentration of alcohol in the foam, right? I don't like foams because of this. Or if you're using a gel that is 60% uh, alcohol, and you, we know that the gelling agents reduce the effective alcohol concentration by 10%. So 63% alcohol gel is actually 53% effective alcohol, right? So you imagine if you then combine it with our ED rate of 23% compliance, low quality product, low compliance rate, and you might start to see, it might be a partial explanation for this. I don't know. However, I don't really think that's the explanation. I think, and you know, what is the role of those one or two people where alcohol rub isn't quite as effective for VRE anyway? We just don't know. But I'll tell you what I think the issue is, and it's related to hospital cleaning. And in particular, you know, we know from, we published some years ago about the value of bleach cleaning of hospital rather than using alcohol wipes for cleaning in hospitals. And we, you know, we cultured VRE on the way chair, and of course it's just then a mathematical issue of whether your bum's the first bum or the last bum on that way chair before it gets cleaned again, right? So we've switched our entire hospital to bleach. You know, we only use bleach, a bleach product now, and had really good results, and we published that the other year. But the thing which I think is the, actually the most plausible link to this emergence of alcohol tolerance has got nothing to do with hand hygiene. It's got to do with electronic medical records. And uh, you may laugh. The point about it is that the introduction of this new strain was almost exactly when we introduced our electronic medical records. Now the relevance is that there are all these mobile computers which can't be cleaned with bleach. And invariably, uh, we call them cows, computers on wheels. I call them bows, bugs on wheels. <laughs> Uh, when we've done environmental swabbing, the return key of these, these uh, bowels are uh, almost invariably colonised with MRSA or VRE. Not the ST796 necessarily, because we don't ST type them all. But these electronic devices are almost always cleaned with alcohol wipes. And as you know, if you leave the lid off, or even if you pull the wipe out, it's 70% isopropanol. But of course, it's evaporating as soon as you've pulled it out. So the amount of effective alcohol you're really wiping those items down with, you have no idea. And so obviously it's not the EMR's fault, but it's the introduction of these electronic devices which can't be cleaned in a, a routine way, it seems to time almost exactly with the emergence of this 796. And, and of course, we what, up until the introduction of bleach, a lot of items were being cleaned with these alcohol wipes, which unlike hand hygiene products, which are tightly standardised for their concentration, it's only standardised while it's in that plastic container. And as soon as it comes out, it might be only 10% by the time if you leave it out in the air for a bit before you use it. So this is a, a, um, 
So the timing and introduction at the Austin seems to align very much. We're about to submit a paper on this. We don't really know whether it's um, the alcohol wipes, but it does seem to be spookily like it's within a matter of three months of the introduction to these mobile computers. And it probably, you know, this doesn't even get to the point of our mobile phones. You know, everyone's walking around using their mobile phones. Certainly with the iPads that we introduced in Victoria, we actually put them into this case that can be wiped down with bleach and, and without damaging the, uh, the, the um, iPad. But um, what's, whether we should now be looking at non-alcohol-based wipes like Clonel wipes or other brands similar to that uh, is a question mark. And I think that's going you know, the topic of this talk is about emerging issues and next year we'll be talking more about this because um, I think we really are going to have to start paying some attention. As I've mentioned already, there are, it's not just about VRE. We've known for a long time that Acinetobacter is inherently more uh, resistant or tolerant to alcohol. It's just that with VRE we've seen a switch from being super sensitive to now certain strains being tolerant. So this is something for you just as ICPs and obviously this doesn't mean we should abandon hand hygiene. If anything, it means we need high compliance and you should be reviewing your products to make sure that they're appropriate standards. Okay. So, um, and then I think personality, personal accountability, we've talked about the ED issues where certain individuals can alter things. So um, I think we'll stop at that point. We were going to take questions, but we're right on five o'clock and I think maybe we've just got time for one or two quick questions. Just a quick question about the um, tolerance to alcohol in the RE. Isn't there some cross-reactivity also tolerance to acid in the same books that might explain? Not from that study, no. Um, it, the, the question um, is not about acid, it is that a, quite a few of these isolates well, in fact, a lot of um, VRE and MRSA isolates have the genes to code for chlorhexidine resistance, um, but they're often not switched on. And the, the interplay between chlorhex and alcohol, no one quite understands. Now, it's odd because if you think about the Geneva study or our, our study at the Austin, we've used alcohol chlorhexidine. They're the only two studies that have shown a material change in sort of disease rates until this Lancet paper. Um, but I think what probably the summary of best answer to your question is this, the bugs are smart, often they've got these genes sitting there and the, where the genes are not always expressed fully and what we don't understand is what is the, what is the right climate for the certain strains that have the genetic element but have an expressed resistance, what switches it on and off. But as for acid, I'm not aware of anything about that. Did, have you heard something different today? Yeah, Tim, uh, Tim, Tim came and talked to us at Alfred Health, and, he, and, and uh, it sound, sounded like a bit of an accident because I think you can think, well, VRE, big evil bug, it's out to get us, but it might actually. Um, Paul, Paul Johnson is presenting it on Tuesday. You can ask him about it. But it wasn't the key. I mean, I was one of the authors. So it wasn't the key feature of this. And, and I guess also we don't kind of clean hospitals with acids. So it would. OK. Uh, look, I just want to thank all the speakers for, day, for today. I think it's uh, been a very successful afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the time. <laughs>